Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week, I have two of ARK's analysts with me. I have Yassine, who covers crypto, and I have Max, who covers fintech. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One major news item that's been developing the last couple of weeks is Facebook's cryptocurrency called Libra. Let's start off with just simply defining what is Libra. Sure. So Libra is designed, so not yet exists, to be a stable digital currency that will be fully backed by a reserve of real assets, specifically a basket of bank deposits and short-term government securities. And interest on these reserve assets will be used to cover the costs of the system to ensure what they expect to be a low transaction fee payment system. And then they pay dividends to investors who provided that upfront capital. So the rules for allocating this interest on the reserves is overseen by a governing body called the Libra Association. The Libra Association is a nonprofit that's based in Switzerland. And as of a few kind of weeks ago, they had announced some founding members of this association, which includes you know, Uber, PayPal, Visa, A16T, USV. And so the Libra Association is the governing body that will ultimately end up minting and burning the Libra coin in response to demand from specific authorized resellers. And so for new coins to ever be minted, there must be kind of a payment of fiat by resellers into the reserve. And so this Libra Association kind of acts as the mechanism for issuing this supply. At a high level in kind of reading Facebook's white paper and their broader mission, it seems like they're really just attempting to revive the payments use case for crypto. So kind of looking at it just straight from the white paper, if you kind of take the quotes, it's really interesting to see the angle that they're attempting to take. So Libra's mission is to, this is quoted, enable a simple global currency and financial infrastructure that empowers billions of people. Just as people can use their phones to message friends anywhere in the world today, with Libra, the same can be done with money, instantly, security, and at a low cost. They also kind of touch on this idea of banking the unbanked and that they believe in this idea of, you know, global, open, instant, low-cost mechanism to move money. So it seems like kind of a revival of of the payments use case. Hmm. From where I sit, you know, there's been a couple of attempts at solving the internet of money. We've had the internet of information, obviously, since at least the early 90s for consumers, but there's never been an effective internet of money. PayPal was one of the first attempts, moderately successful, maybe moderate plus. Bitcoin was the maybe the follow-on attempt, a completely different approach. Not really successful for transmitting money, but pretty successful for store value use case. And now it seems like Facebook is coming in with a third attempt, each of these from very different kinds of organizations. This is their take on this, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I will push back on Bitcoin not successfully being able to transmit money. It, for, it, for payments, like for, common I payments. I mean, it, it's, it's really this idea of like the... It's the censorship resistant or borderless or open nature of being able to transmit money, right? Where it's like what our definition of the internet of money is, right? If the internet of money is some very fast, low cost, convenient, high speed transaction, then yeah, then it makes sense that you would actually end up wanting to use, you know, a P2P payment system over Bitcoin. But if it's like the unfettered access to being able to store and transfer value, kind of agnostic of any jurisdiction, then I would say Bitcoin has has massively succeeded in that. I guess from where Facebook sits, their core business is obviously slowing down. And payments, we have many options. You know, we can use Venmo, it's pretty good. We can use credit cards, it's pretty good. In China, Alipay, 
WeChat, those things are quite successful. But there's no, it doesn't feel like there's been this solution to value transmission, money transmission as comprehensively and as fully as, say, Facebook has succeeded or email has succeeded. Still a hugely fragmented market. And I guess that's why they see an opportunity. In their minds, no one has fully won and they have a valid approach at taking a shot at this. You've seen, if you look at Libra in comparison to the existing kind of blockchains out there and coins out there, where would you say it fits in the public and private taxonomy? Where does it fit overall in relation to the other chains out there? Sure. So it seems to be, you know, a hybrid between permissionless and permissioned. So explain those two concepts. Sure. So so the idea of, of having a permissionless network is that specifically with regard to validators, and whoever kind of has access to the network, it's completely open. There isn't some sort of kind of consortia of, of validators that are predetermined by some sort of centralized control or authority. So in the case of, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum, these are permissionless networks. So they are open, they are public, they are neutral, they are borderless and censorship resistant. With regard to Facebook, specifically the Libra Association, the network of validators are chosen based on, you know, specific prerequisites. And that is, you know, for instance, in the case of becoming a founding member, there is a requirement to make an upfront cost of, you know, $10 million to support it. There needs, there are like kind of specific guidelines and requisites that these founding members must meet in order to qualify as a node. And so basically the verification of transactions, the decision-making involved, even from a technical standpoint, is all dependent on these consortia of nodes. So in that sense, it is, I would say, semi-permissioned. So it's kind of trading off. If you have a fully permissioned blockchain, one or two companies control it and you have very high transaction rates, very you don't have to spread out the infra, so it's very quick, high capacity, but it's not very trustworthy, right? You're centralizing a lot of the control. Your Bitcoin, you're on the other end, you're completely decentralized. A grandmother could join the network and start mining and confirming transactions, but you can only do like seven transactions on the main chain a second. So you can have very, very, very secure, but slow or less secure and fast. And they're somewhere in the middle. That's correct. There are trade-offs to kind of convenience of using and interfacing with an underlying protocol and the idea of being trust minimized. So, you know, the question then just boils down to what exactly is, is the innovation of cryptocurrencies? Is it just to provide a convenient mechanism and ease of payment? Or again, is it this idea of being able to have kind of full, true ownership over kind of wealth and the transmission of value? So from a data structure standpoint, the Libra underlying blockchain is actually more like Ethereum or even Ripple than it is like Bitcoin. So there are a few What's reasons for that. What's the buzzword name for its blockchain? So that, very interestingly, they're not actually using a blockchain per se. It's more of like a virtual construct of transactions that are taken at like a specific snapshot. So there's not like a chain of blocks that every 10 minutes or two minutes are, are produced. So Rather, it's like the idea of the record keeping model is definitely different than what we see with Bitcoin. And it's more akin to the Ethereum's and the Ripples of the world. So there are two kind of primary record keeping models. There's the unspent transaction output, the UTXO model that Bitcoin employs. And then there's the account based model. And so for the UTXO model, each transaction spends output from prior transactions and then generates new outputs that can be spent by the transactions in the future. And so that compared to an account-based model is basically you're just keeping track of a balance on each account as a global state. So if I hold five Ethereum or five Libra and I send one Libra to you, the account-based model will basically just update the state by having four on my end and one on yours. And so there are, again, different trade-offs to having these models. The UTXO one is basically, you know, for scalability and privacy specifically. And then the account base is more for kind of simplicity and efficiency. All right. If you step back for a moment, it's kind of something remarkable has happened. We have a private company and it started issuing what appears to be money. This seems like a very interesting phenomenon. We haven't really observed this in the past. So when you think about Libra in the context of the broader implications for money and who controls it, who can create it, what does that say to you? 
Yeah, this is actually why I'm so excited about the idea of Libra, even for, you know, the cryptocurrency space more more generally. And then the idea of being able to kind of create non-governmental money forms. Facebook's attempt beyond Bitcoin is the most legitimate that we've seen to date. So if we go back to the days of Frederick Hayek, who was an Austrian economist, and he's written a lot of very interesting kind of, you know, frameworks that a lot of cryptocurrency enthusiasts resonate with. In the 70s, he wrote something called the denationalization of money. And basically, it advocated a system of private currency in which financial institutions create currencies that compete for acceptance. And so the idea is that a national government issuing a specific currency, which is imposed on the economy in the form of legal tender laws, is not the most efficient mechanism by which to issue money. And so in fact, private businesses should be able to issue their own forms of money. Very interestingly... Is that legal in the US? So that's the idea is that it's not a matter of, is it legal? It's a matter of, is it possible? And so before the creation of Bitcoin, like this idea wasn't even really possible, right? Where you couldn't have a non-government backed money. And what really introduced the possibility of this was literally public private key cryptography. Like that specific technology enabled people to basically have a full ownership and pseudonymity over their wealth. Or distribute trust, really. And, yeah. and, and distribute trust, exactly. So basically, you're able to, to replace a middleman with a marketplace of competing nodes. And so that's like really, really interesting. And Facebook basically opens the playing field for that. With Bitcoin, it was, you know, for a long time, people say, well, the, the US government obviously holds the, the keys to this. They don't want anyone to be creating their own money. But with Bitcoin, there was no one to blame. There was no one to go after. All you have is a white paper and a Japanese sounding name. So they almost perhaps were a little asleep at the wheel and didn't take it seriously. Maybe with, with the benefit of hindsight, they would have shut it down somehow. But right. now it's kind of the cat's out of the bag. But this is different. This is Facebook doing it. And they do have a name. They do have a company. They have an address. And you can call a phone number. And you can subpoena Mark to Congress. So this is a bit tricky, isn't it? Like how it's are the, very interesting. How is Facebook yeah. going to say, we're going to kind of create this new thing called money. You should let us. And it's going to be good for you. It seems like the regulatory pressure, the second they announced, the second the leak started happening, both the US government and other governments have basically started saying, hey, wait, and we're not sure we're going to allow you to do this. How's the regulatory environment turned out for this initiative? This has been really interesting to see how these dynamics have played, where literally from a regulatory standpoint, all eyes are now on Facebook. And it's like this idea of, okay, if we miss the boat on being able to shut down Bitcoin, because that was effectively impossible, it's much easier to point fingers at like a centralized issuer, like a Facebook. And so you kind of see that like firsthand where, you know, people have already started to see this backlash from Facebook effectively competing against commercial and central banks. And the answer is not obvious. Like the idea of having a centralized issuer they may never end up launching. And like you have a big camp that is saying, you know, there's no way that they're going to end up, you know, launching this to begin with. And kind of recently, you saw the House Financial Services Committee basically calling for a moratorium on the development of Facebook's Libra. And you have other members of Congress joining where they basically say that this is clearly intended to compete against U.S. monetary policy and the dollar. And so this raises a lot of questions and we're not going to let you do this or we're going to try to put in as many barriers as possible in order for you to stop doing this. And so even France's finance minister said exactly this, where I'm quoting this, Libra can't and must not happen <laughs> and that it is out of the question for the cryptocurrency to become a sovereign currency. So it's like they've basically found someone to point a finger to and that's Facebook. With Bitcoin, it's like, who do you point the finger to? And that's kind of what many people are shedding light on, is that the whole value proposition is being able to have something that regardless of the legal or regulatory jurisdictions that are set, there's not much that they can do beyond that. And so with Facebook, that might be different. Yeah. And then another perspective to that is that even 
if Libra launches, and with Libra, I also mean Calibra, which is Facebook's digital wallet that comes with it, and it is kind of the place where Libra lives, so to say. Even if those two are going to launch in Western countries, regulation in countries abroad, let's say in, in India and in other developing nations, could really impact the rollout and distribution of it. Maybe we can talk about distribution later, but one of the key you know, go-to-market strategies, we believe, for Libra will be remittances. And in Calibra's terms of service, it specifically says that Calibra, like I said, a digital wallet, will not be available in countries that ban cryptocurrencies. India bans cryptocurrencies and on the other side according to the world bank is the number one remittance recipient in the world with 79 billion dollars per year so figuring out that question you know it's not only vital to just libra launching but then actually it's success yeah just hearing the huge regulatory tidal wave that's come over facebook a it's just you know, a company doing this is so much harder than a anonymous organization doing this. It's kind of such a great reflection of the innovator's dilemma, right? The new entrant always looks nothing like the existing companies. Bitcoin looks nothing like a company, right? Whereas when the existing companies try to respond and do even the right thing, they're held back by virtue of who they are. By virtue of them having an existing business, having a number, having an address, it is really hard to actually address disruption, even when you try to do all the right things. The go-to-market looks like a nightmare. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the broader go-to-market still, in some sense, really is a mystery. Like, everybody's talking about Facebook's 2.3 billion users that they can use to scale this. And of course, this sounds great, but that doesn't mean that there will be an automatic adoption of all these 2.3 billion users. Actually, you know, Facebook allowed peer-to-peer -peer payments via the messenger since, I believe, 2014-15. Um, you know, they hired David Marcus from PayPal back in 2014. And that was when everybody thought, hey, you know, this is going to be Facebook's payment push. And after that, they, like I said, they included the payments into the messenger platform. We don't really have any metrics if that was successful, but it doesn't, doesn't really feel, very doesn't successful. feel that way, right? Yes. And then you can go back in kind of mass adoption payment history and look at other you know large companies such as facebook that had a legacy business and then added kind of a fintech or crypto layer on top of that and what you see is that all these companies they took specific actions they incentivized their existing user base to join that network that payment platform so for example with wechat when they rolled out wechat pay in 2013 only around eight percent of the user base at the end of the year used wechat pay the big wechat pay adoption only came after then in January 2014, WeChat Pay started these red envelope campaigns that are well known, but where WeChat Pay basically was giving out money and connected with this, you know, cultural element of Chinese society. And, and after that first campaign, the WeChat Pay numbers tripled. And you can point to other examples. You have Line in Japan, which also has a large user base of around 80 million active users per month in, in Japan. And they are also incentivizing users to join their payments platform by waiving the merchant fees for these QR code machines. You know, you a, a lot of different examples. So Earlier it's been PayPal, of anything, right? Yeah. PayPal was OG version of internet of money, and they couldn't get adoption until they just tried this radical thing of we're just going to give users users money, money. Exactly. we're gonna deposit exactly. what was it 10 bucks in each yeah, user like account bucks and, yeah, and, like, and, and, and have that to give referrals just gonna and, airdrop. and that literally kicked yeah. off the bootstrapping of users for yeah. paypal back in the 1960s the predecessors of the visa and mastercard card networks they mailed out credit cards some estimates say they mailed up to 100 million credit cards throughout the US in the late 1960s, just to get this device into users hands. So it's going to be interesting what measures Facebook will take to go to market. I think there are a few angles you can take. Remittances probably is, is the most attractive, especially in terms of the developing countries. And there, I think we don't even need an explicit kind of nudge to get users to use them. You know, it might be enough that in the next update, of WhatsApp or Messenger, now you have Libra in the app and you just compare the fees that you pay with Libra in terms of peer-to-peer -peer remittances with the fees you're used to from Western Union or another kind of legacy provider now and that might be enough. The question though is that like it's not so much from like 
will users use this? Is that it's will users allow to use yeah. this in emerging market? Like for emerging markets, it's clear that governments don't want Libra. I mean, like having a dollar backed digital coin on your phone is so much more convenient and better than any, you know, emerging market currency that's experiencing kind of a crisis. So before you move on, I, I want to like address your point on the remittances where it's like, it seems like this is the perfect use case for remittances. But it also seems like the jurisdictions, like you said, that actually would need remittances would not actually practically be able to use Libra for these remittances. And so the biggest question is really the idea of like AML KYC and whether or not that's going to be required. What does all that mean? So it stands for anti-money laundering and like know your customer. So So so, regulatory requirements. Regulatory requirements where are you going to need to basically provide and disclose all of your information in order to use Libra? And there's a very kind of interesting play. And I don't know if like Facebook is just trying to release like a beast into the wild and pretend that like they're coding it with like a KYC AML process for Calibra because in the white paper, it explicitly says that Libra is going to have the same pseudonymity as like a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency, but that Calibra will require you to do KYC AML. So it will be banned in cryptocurrencies that ban governments, but the Libra protocol itself is not linked to any real world identity. So you're able to, as a user, create multiple accounts, multiple private keys. And so that's like, if the only on-ramping is Calibra, are they trying to appease regulators by saying, we're going to do KYC AML? Can Facebook enforce Calibra being the only on-ramp? No, no. So their whole strategy for Calibra specifically is like they want to become like the de facto cryptocurrency wallet, right? And so... This is separate from the Libra Association. This is also a subsidiary of Facebook. And like Max said, like this is kind of clearly their path to monetization. They want it to be the first and primary touch point. They're going to have, I would say, at least a year ahead of any sort of competition, right, sure. in order to kind of get this. But you would imagine that there will be competing wallets for Libra. So I think yeah. that's a really subtle point. And that is Facebook has two things going on here. It's trying to spawn a new cryptocurrency that's based on a basket of real money in, in the real world. And it's trying to basically stay as hands off on that portion as possible. Many people right. were thinking Facebook would right. just mint its own coin, Facebook coin. That is not what they're doing. They're saying, we'll kind of spawn, we'll help guide the creation of this new bas- this money. And hopefully this will actually just be managed on its own using the Libra Foundation. We don't actually care about that part, which is interesting that they're not trying to gain control of this new money that they're creating. What they're trying to do is to be the primary interface to this new pile of money through their Calibra wallet. But they're not saying we're the only ones who can build this wallet. It is an open protocol money. So anyone in theory can build it, but will be, you know, as default as an iOS app in in the sense of well-built and distributed. Yeah. Yeah. So like I would expect them to try to disassociate themselves as quickly as possible to the Libra blockchain, to Libra. They've like explicitly said that they want to relinquish as much control. Founding members and any node will not have more than 1% of kind of quote unquote, voting power. So that's like the real question. Whereas like, is this almost like a sly way to using Calibra's regulation angle to mask what this really is? Or will they end up actually effectively taking control of the underlying Libra blockchain? Okay, let's go around the table and just state what we, I guess, what's our overall feeling on this and what's the next thing that we're looking forward to just to see if this is going to succeed. I'll just start here. I think this is basically Facebook two things. One is they need a new strategy to go forward for growth. Their advertising, their core business is slowing down. It's going to take some effort to convert those Instagram stories to add dollars. And they want something that can sustain the company that's bold and ambitious enough for the next 10 years. I think they've looked at the landscape. They've seen that no one's really solved the internet of money. There are drawbacks with things like Venmo and and PayPal, and there are drawbacks with things like Bitcoin. And they're like, maybe we're in a position where we can tackle this. I think the thing I'm looking forward to most is seeing their go-to-market strategy of how they get people to use it. I think the existing apps we have today are pretty good for peer-to-peer transfer in the West. So my prediction would be that given that David Marcus is there, I can totally see them seeding the wallets with some amount of the currency. It could be funded through ads. It could be funded through balance sheet. Who knows? But 
that's what I'm looking for to see what their viral bootstrap mechanism is. You see? Yeah, sure. So before any of that, I am looking forward to seeing whether or not they actually end up launching. So they are expected to launch in 2020. I would not be surprised if it's at least delayed. And I would not be shocked if they don't actually ever end up launching. Now, if they do... That would be a huge embarrassment, no? I mean, if it's a regulatory reason, then they kind of have a finger to blame. Like, Mm -hmm. there's really nothing that we can do. We really tried this. I don't think that they'll, like, just back down without a fight. I think if they do end up launching, that they could be very, very successful. And the idea of kind of really unlocking the convenience of payment use case globally is a compelling kind of narrative that could end up coming to fruition. And so I also am interested in kind of looking at this as a potential on-ramp into pure cryptocurrencies. So for instance, if... if so the gateway drug to right, real crypto. I mean, that's really what it is. <laughs> and so if they end up kind of allowing you to export your private keys and it's listed on, you know, exchanges that also trade Bitcoin and Ethereum, then, you know, people are seeing that their Libra is going down compared to Bitcoin and they just end up market buying Bitcoin. So <laughs> this could be a that really is totally not your scene's actual hopes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but and if you look at this even in the context of how many users there are, it's like they're estimated, you know, between 30 and 60 million Bitcoin users. Uh, Facebook has upwards of 2 billion. And while, yeah, their network effects aren't as like, they don't translate as well, or there may need to be additional incentives to encourage adoption. It's like they can easily, you know, fail and still triple the number of cryptocurrency users. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Yeah. yeah so agree with Yassine on the regulation part. I think that's a key thing to look out for in the near medium term future. And then after that, the go to market strategy will be really interesting. We talked about remittances, which is going to be tricky, as Yassine said, from the KYC AML angle in the developing countries. The bigger question maybe even is how would it look in the Western countries and developed countries? You just said, James, that here we already have figured out the P2P payments, right? A lot of people use Venmo Cash App. So what Facebook, well, let's say Libra or rather Calibra will do or could do here is to partner with the network that they already put together from the Libra founding members, Libra Association founding members, where you have an Uber, where you have a Lyft. So the idea there would be that, you know, you go onto your Lyft or Uber account and now you have a new payment option. You can pay with Libra. They're cutting out the transaction fees. I think Uber last year paid around $1 billion in transaction fees, credit card transaction fees. So Uber could be also interested in that, or for sure is. And then, you know, offer the user incentive, let's say, save 2%, maybe subsidize it and make 5% out of it. That sounds a little bit more attractive. You know, go that route. Or then with Facebook specifically, I think for them, one go-to-market would also be to just offer low friction payments with Instagram, you know, or the Facebook marketplace. I think these are also two very interesting options for Facebook specifically. Yeah. Very exciting. All right. Nice talking to you guys. Looking forward to seeing what Facebook does next. Thanks. Thank you. That's it for this week. You can find the full ARC team on Twitter. We'll catch you next week. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.